Good morning. Welcome to the Father's House. So excited to see all of you here, including those of you online. Welcome. I'm excited because this first song talks about our risen Savior. So let's sing it out because he is alive. Risen, he's risen, forever glorified. Risen, he's risen, King Jesus, King Jesus is alive. Hallelujah, oh, 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 hallelujah. 
God, we are thankful for your sacrifice this morning. But the great part about that sacrifice is not that it ended in your, just your death, God, but that we have the victory and the power when you rose from the grave. So we're thankful, God, this morning. Seated on the throne of Father, the well that overflows, the God who was and is and shall be forevermore. Holy. Sing and 
one with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation now reveals in you are Christ. You say, what a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Majestic, holy, set apart. There is none like you. None can that that can even stand in comparison with you. You stand alone. You are holy. You are mighty. You are powerful, God. All that exists is because of you. All creation sits and exalts you because you are mighty, God. We join with the chorus of angels this morning and we exalt you for who you are because we are made in the image of you. We stand in the power that you have given us when you were raised from the grave. You are mighty. You are powerful. We stand with you, almighty God. Nothing can stand against. 
It's, a, it's an amazing thing to think about how we were lost, doing our own thing, and Jesus came and found us. Aren't you thankful for that? I, I was standing over there just a couple of minutes ago, and, and, I, and I just heard the Lord say in, in my spirit, there's somebody here today that's been playing games with Jesus. You, 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 you put on a happy Jesus face when you come to church. But this week, you've said something like this. I need to get serious. I really need to get serious. Because I know I'm not where I need to be with the Lord. Here's the amazing thing about Jesus. Jesus knew in advance that you would be here today. For whatever reason you came, somebody bribed you, somebody begged you to come, or you just decided today is the day to come. No, you just didn't decide. Jesus knew you were coming, and uh, he wanted that song about his blood. You know, we, people say, well, I don't talk about the blood. But you see, the blood sacrifice covered the penalty of our sins. In the Old Testament, every year on the Day of Atonement, a spotless lamb was sacrificed because of sin. Not to forgive sin, but to postpone sin another year and postpone sin another year because one day the Lamb of God the spotless Lamb of God before the creation of the world isn't that amazing before God ever created us He knew that we'd need a Savior He already had a plan it didn't sneak up on Him and so He said I'll send my Son and He sent His Son Jesus you know why? because He wants us to be able to experience heaven with Him there's a God vacuum on the inside of our heart. And, and, and unless you let Jesus into your heart, you're always going to be searching for something. Like this week, you said, there's got to be more. There's, there's something more. Yeah, there is. It's surrendering your life totally to Jesus. Jesus came and he died on the cross as a spotless lamb to pay for my sins. And so all those sins for all the Old Testament, it's forgiven. All the sins for the future, forgiven if you look to the cross and say, I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus died for my sins and God raised him on the third day. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I just sense the Lord moving through this building this, this morning right now. That there's no reason to go on another moment as the Lord is speaking to your heart. Some of you right now, your heart just beating a little harder. and You think, you know, what's up? You're not having a heart attack. It's just the Lord drawing you with his wonderful love.
Some of your hands are getting a little sweaty. Your palms are getting sweaty. You know why? It's because of the battle you have of getting ready to surrender your life totally to Jesus. Totally. I use that word totally this morning. Because there's some that have just been riding the fence and playing a game. You've been saying, you know, I went to church all my life. But today the Lord's calling you to take a step and commit everything to Him. Here's what I'd love to do before we go any farther. Because I know there's somebody here today that this week has said, I've got to get serious with God, and I want to pray for you. There's someone here today that said, you know, there's a huge vacuum in my life, and I really know that I need Jesus as my Savior. I'm not going to embarrass you today. I'm just offering the greatest news that you can of Jesus Christ to come into your life, to forgive you of your sins, and to give you a purpose for living. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. No one moving around, no one talking. The church is praying for you. But if you're here today and you say, Terry, things are not quite right between me and God. And I want to make a decision today to make sure everything is right before us. I want to surrender my life, the control of my life to him. I don't know how to do that completely. I'm not sure how I can make it. But I know right now I sense his spirit drawing me. His Holy Spirit is drawing you today. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you in just a minute to raise your hand and make eye contact with me. I'm not going to ask you to say anything out loud to embarrass yourself to people around you. I'm not going to call you down front. I'm just going to simply lead you in a prayer today. We'll all pray this prayer together. But the Holy Spirit is drawing people today to Him. And some of you that are watching online, it's the same way. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do right now as the church is praying. If you're here today and you would simply say, Terry, I need a Savior and I need to surrender my life to Him today. I, I need to get serious with Him today. Would you just raise your hand right where you're standing and make eye contact with me? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you back here. Come on, raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Others today, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you back in the back. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, young man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Scripture said, as many as call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. So about 12, 13 people just raised their hand and said, I want my eternity changed. I want my purpose changed of of where where I'm going. So no one moving around right now. No one talking, please. I don't want you to disturb what anybody else is doing. This is a serious time. This is not a time for anything but this. People's eternities are about to change. And so I, I want you right now to pray this prayer with me. Say this prayer with me. Lord God, I surrender my life to you. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. And I thank you for rising again, that I can have a fresh start, a new beginning. So I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you are God and you died on the cross for my sins. And you rose from the grave that I can have a fresh start, a new beginning. I don't understand it all, But I trust you. I put my future in your hands. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name. Now listen. There's about 12, 13 hands that raised. Here's what I want you to do. Ushers, we have the little What Now book. I'm throwing you off right now, but if you'll grab those What Now books, uh, some of you are already ready. I want you to come down front. Those of you who prayed that prayer with me over here, 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 here. Just raise your hand. I want to give you this book. Come on, church. Let's celebrate. Raise your hand again. Raise your hand again. Come on, raise your hand. There you go. Come on, church. Celebrate this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Just keep your just keep your hand raised if you didn't get a book yet. Just keep your hand raised. You're going to get one of these What Now books that's going to help you. And then in a minute, when you sit down, there's going to be a connection card I want you to fill out and say, I want to be baptized in February when we do that. I'm going to encourage you to get into growth track. Find somebody and tell them what Jesus did for you. In fact, I'll be out in the foyer at the end of the service. Come by and say, I prayed that prayer with you today. I prayed that prayer with you today. Wow. 
Well, listen, if you were standing around somebody who prayed that prayer, who raised their hand, you may not even know that, but it's just so let's just take some time right now to just say hey to somebody and, and, and just give them a high five, a fist pump, something. And let me say, may welcome those of you that are watching online. I'm so glad you joined us today. The teaching notes are there for you and, and, uh, and a place for to leave your prayer request. We love you. We thank you for watching with us today. In a few weeks, we'll have our upgraded equipment out. It'll be better flow, but we're so thankful that you joined us today. God bless you. have a blessed life, but what does that really mean? Is it simply having a nice car, a big house, new clothes? What if a blessed life isn't what you think? What if it's more about what you give away than what you hold on to? What if it's more about the contents of your heart than the contents of your bank account? How do we really live the blessed life? Wow. Man, did it feel good? Let's, uh, didn't the worship team do a great job today? Let's thank God for that team. Let me say, if you're a, if you're a musician or you're a singer, uh, they have rehearsal every Thursday night. And you come on and hang out with them, see what's going on. And it's a great opportunity. If you know someone who is a, uh, a musician or a singer, invite them. Yeah, man. We just we want to see that team grow and grow and grow. Uh, under the chair in front of you, in the chair in front of you is a card. It looks like this. It's a connection card. Would you take just a moment and fill that out today? We all fill those out every Sunday. It's a way for you to uh, make a prayer request. It's for you to do a praise report. Especially if you're a first-time guest, would you please fill that out today? I want to send you a little note this week. Just say thank you for coming. I'm not going to ask you for money. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I just want to say thank you for coming. Also, if you live in the villages, be sure you fill out one because we're doing another meeting at the Eisenhower Center in February. Be a nice little, great little potluck lunch and uh, or eat evening meal. And so we'd like for you to come and to be with us at that time. Also, uh, just a couple things. Life groups are signing up outside. Be sure you do that. If you signed up for or you want to sign up for the work as worship, we are combining ours with Heritage Church so that we can have one good size group. So go ahead and go online, sign up there as work as worship, and, and you can do that. Also, uh, um, Team TFH, write this date down. March 23rd, March 23rd, March 23rd. It's a Friday evening. It's going to be our Team TFH party. It's our big celebration in which that we honor those who are a part of Team TFH. You say, what's Team TFH? Well, Team TFH is people who serve, people who serve in some area here. They're on the team. Right? You can't be on a team unless you're serving, right? You know, all the football games we'll watch this afternoon, a couple of good ones. And, uh, and, and so the people in the stands are not part of the team. People are part of the team. They're out there actually working, doing with the team. So you say, how do I become part of the team? Well, you volunteer, you serve somewhere. But to do that, you will have been through all four steps of the growth track, four steps of the growth track. And you will assign to become a partner with us. And then you will be part of Team TFH. Now, some of you serve right now, but you haven't been through growth track. And you haven't signed the, uh, the, the partner form to join with us. I, I want to be a partner. On, I want to be part of Team TFH. So you need to contact your department head because there will be a special meeting in February that I'm meeting. It's not open to everyone, just for those of you that are already serving. Because I'm rewriting, redoing the growth track, which in February we have no growth track. But we'll redo that and start in March with a brand new updated uh, books. And it's really going to be great. But listen, for those of you who are already serving, if you haven't been through growth track and if you haven't signed the, the partnership, 
that I want to encourage you to be part of this meeting that's coming up in February. And so you need to contact your department head so that you will know all about that. Okay? All right. If you came in today and you didn't receive your teaching notes, would you come on, ushers? Just raise your hand and the ushers will be happy to give you one of those. And on the very back of your teaching notes today is a great declaration. We just ended our seven day of fast and seeking God. So if you didn't get one, just raise your hand. The ushers will be happy to give you one. All right. You got your Bibles? We'll continue. You got your Bibles? All right. Or on your smartphone, wherever you have, let's hold it up today and let's make our confession. Are you ready? Let's say it. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It is life to me. Today I receive the Word. I confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I am obedient. And I will never be the same again in Jesus' name. Father, we just pause right now to thank you. We thank you for your presence. Many of us have gone to church in and out all of our life. And we just go through the motions and we say, okay, it started and it stopped. But Lord, I just want to thank you for your presence that's here with us today. We may not even be able to explain it. But Lord, your presence is here. And we thank you. And we thank you for the 12 or 13 people that made a life change decision today. And we pray they'll follow you on into water baptism. They'll, they'll sign up for that. You said, repent and be baptized. And Lord, we just, we just thank you that we're blessed at the Father's house. That every week people make a decision to follow you. Lord, and we, we don't take that lightly, but we honor you. And we give you thanks in your name. Wow. Wow. Well, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise and say, thank you, Lord, for your presence. We're in this series called The Blessed Life. And uh, we said the blessed life doesn't necessarily mean, you know, sometimes we see people driving a nice car, have a nice home. We say they're living the blessed life. Well, that, that may be true. It may not be true. Just material things doesn't mean that you live the blessed life. I know a lot of people that have got a lot of things, but they certainly don't live a blessed life. Uh, they live a life of constant torment. Uh, but the blessed life, we said, is much more than that. Uh, the blessed life, we said biblically, is basically I have God's presence in my life and God's promises working in my life. Let's say that. God's presence in my life and God's promises working in my life. We said the key to a blessed life is what kind of a heart? The key to a blessed life is what kind of a heart? Generous. Look at your neighbor and say a generous heart. Generous heart. We said our theme verse that we're looking at were from the words of Jesus, that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Let's say that. It's more blessed to give and receive. How many of you believe that? How many of you believe that's a lie? It's more blessed to give than to receive. There's just something about that, right? I mean, I like to receive. Uh, my, one of my love languages is gifts. I like gifts. But I also love to give. Anita tells me often, she said, you just love to give. You just, you'd give everything away but me, wouldn't you? And yeah, I probably would. Uh, but I'm not going to give her away. She's teaching next door, but you, you can tell her I said that, so maybe she'll be nicer to me this afternoon. No, she's nice to me all the time. Well, mostly all the time. So anyway, how many of you, how many, I digress. Forgive me. Those of you who are new this morning, get used to it. I digress. I make up words. I make up words. They're all re real good words. I think they should include them in the dictionary. We'll see one of these days. Uh, the Terry Mayhan addition to the dictionary. That would, be, that would be good. How many of you, by the raising your hand, feel like you're blessed? I mean, uh, uh, when you look at the world and people around you, do you, do you feel like that you're, you're really blessed? But do you ever ask yourself or even think about this? Why am I so blessed? Why, why am I so blessed? We said the blessed life is more than just about finances. It's about with your health, with relationships. It's with, uh, uh, with, 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 our, with our family, with our emotions. We're blessed. Why is it that I'm so blessed? Well, here it is today. It's the title of today's teaching. Look out on your notes there. We're blessed to do what? We're blessed to what? Look at your neighbor and say, you're blessed to be a blessing. So get to it. Uh, who have you blessed this week? Blessed to be a blessing. Here's a great verse. It's not in your notes. Uh, it's, uh, it's from uh, Proverbs 22 and 9. It's up on the screen. 
Would you read this with me? Because I think we all want to be more blessed. But look at this. Read it with me. He who has a generous eye will be blessed. He who has a what? All right. So look at your neighbor. Look at their eye and see if it's generous. Is their eye generous? Hmm. Is uh, uh, both eyes generous? Uh, have it, well, you say, well, how do you know if you got a generous eye? Well, listen, some of you have a, an eye for, for detail. Like, um, I have a real eye for detail. Right, staff? No. I'm not a detail person. I'm a bottom line. Don't give me all the detail. I just want the bottom line, all right? But some of you have, some of you have an eye for, for detail. Some of you have an eye for seeing things. You have an, an eye for fashion. You know, and some of you don't. I can see it every Sunday. You have no eye for fashion. Uh, some of you have a have an eye of some of you ladies have an eye of how to do makeup. And and if you don't, then find somebody that does. All right. Some of you guys have an eye for you know manicuring yourself. You shave your no ha nose hairs and ear hairs and and uh, and and you do that. So if you, if you don't know how to do that, we'll we'll find somebody that does to help you. Someone has an eye for those things. But I want to be known as someone who has an eye to be generous, a generous eye. Um, God's people are blessed to be a blessing. In other words, he wants to flow blessings through us so that he could get it to other people. Those of you that are going to the Holy Land with us in December, and uh, we'll be talking more about that pretty soon. We have some brochures out in the out in the foyer, but we're going to the Holy Land, and, and there's an option to go on down to the sea, the Dead Sea. And when you go down to the Dead Sea, it's dead. The reason it's dead, it's a dam. Everywhere around, it's a dam. It has no way. It has nothing to flow out. Some of you live a damn life. Excuse me for saying it like that, but here's what it is, how I mean that. I didn't say that in the first service, so I said that to wake up somebody in this service, evidently. But you have a life that just dams up all the blessings around you. You think everything is just for you. And so, so you just, you just hold it. You know, you, you want relationships, but you don't want to have a relationship with anybody else. Uh, and so it's just, it's just all there. But no, we are blessed to be a blessing. Um, there's a principle in the Bible that you can't get away from if you're a believer or not a believer. It's if you sow, you're going to reap. If you tithe, you're going to receive God's blessings. God said if you tithe, return the first portion. We talked about that last week. If you weren't here, you might want to get that and listen to it. Go on the archives and listen to that. We said the first 10% of my increase belongs to God. And he said if you do that, I will bless you and prosper you. I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you that you can't contain. And, and I've know, I know people who are not believers, and they use the principle, the tithe, by saying, I know, God, I can't outgive you, and if I return back to you what's yours, then I, I believe we don't give to twist God's arm. But what I'm saying is, it's a principle, right? How many of you know that principle works in your life? Raise your hand. It's a principle that works. So Satan cannot change that. But here's what he can do. He can distort, say distort. He can distort our understanding of the blessings of God. He, he, can, he can distort that, the whole thing that we're, we're blessed of God. And uh, how, how does he do that? So there are two wrong responses, two wrong responses to God's blessings there in your note. If you want to fill it in, here's the first one. Uh, as you're opening your Bible to Revelation 3 and 17. Would you do that? Open up your Bible with me today to Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Here's the first response to God's blessing, and here it is. It's pride. Say pride. Jesus is speaking to the church at Laodicea who has a lot of things, and, and he says to them, Revelation 3, 17. Are you there? All right. It's the end of the Bible. It's the last book, okay? Look in your Bible. See this, all right? You say, I am rich. In other words, you're saying, I earned all this. I did this. I have acquired wealth, and I don't need a thing. He's, he was saying to the church at Laodicea, you think all the wealth and the blessings that you have, you made it happen yourself. And he's simply saying, that's pride. You see, there's some of you that are here today, you say, I am a self-made or a self-made man or woman. I worked hard. I got an education. I did this. I started my business when everybody other businesses crumbled. I am today who I am because of me. I made this happen. Uh, and, and so that's what he's saying here to the, to the church at Laodicea. He's saying what you've got is pride. 
you have pride. But look what he says next. But he says, but don't you realize that you are wretched? You are wretched, you are pitiful, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. He says, look, you think you've done all this by yourself. I'm not lazy. Everybody else is lazy. If they'd work as hard as I would, they wouldn't have unemployment. They wouldn't be begging. They wouldn't do some of that. I've worked hard. I've made myself who I am. He's simply saying what you realize, what you understand here is you're saying it's all about I. It's about me. I did this. And he's simply saying that's a prideful attitude because you've forgotten that I am your source. I am your source. I am your source. I am the one who gave you life. I am the one who, who brought that into your life. But, but it's not just people who are affluent or well off, but it's also people who have a spirit of entitlement. The root of a spirit of entitlement is pride. It's I deserve what you have. Now, I'm not willing to do what you did to get it, but I deserve what you have. I deserve it. So here, 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 here's what a person of entitlement says. If I had what you had, I, I, would, I would be able to take care of it different. I'd be able to see those things. It's that spirit of entitlement that I deserve what you've got. I, I can't believe you've got it and I don't have it. And I deserve it. What it is? It's pride. Sometimes people call it jealousy. I call it pride. It's that, it's that whole principle. Listen to the words. I deserve what you've got. I deserve um, I'm, I'm a very giving person. I give things away. I've given ties away. I've given motorcycles away. I've given lots of stuff away. We don't sell things at our house, but we go through the closet. We go through what we have, and we give it away. Um, several years ago, I was preaching up in North Carolina somewhere, and I, was, I preached first, and somebody come after me. And, and uh, I was sitting on the front row, and, and, uh, and, and this guy was preaching, and he says, Oh, man, I like your shoes. See, I like shoes. I like really different shoes. Most shoes on men are boring. And that's why when I'm with my wife, I, I first thing I'll look at a woman is her shoes. Because I think women have great shoes. I mean, it's just so creative. Shoes and purses. I'm okay with my femininity, okay? And I do carry a man purse from time to time. But it doesn't have bling on it. But I, but I like, I look at shoes that people have. I just like them. So I had just bought these shoes. They were kind of neat. And I was sitting there and he said, oh, I love your shoes. Well, if that had been all he said, I might have given him those shoes. But he didn't say that. He said, if you was obeying God, you'd give me those shoes. Spirit of entitlement. You've got what I want and I deserve those. So he went over and preached something. He came back to me. Brother, you listen to God? You're going to give me those shoes? I thought it would be a cold day in hell before I give you these shoes. If you'd have just said at the very beginning, I like your shoes, and left it at that, and said, you know, God, speak to him. And if God said to me, give him the shoes, I'd have walked out in my socks. I honestly would have I'd given him those shoes. But not when he's got that spirit of entitlement that I deserve. Because you have the spirit of pride. And you give to somebody who has a heart of entitlement, and it's got to be more the next time. Okay, well, I've got this amount of free stuff. Now give me more free stuff. Give me more free stuff. Don't ask me. Don't ask me to give anything for it, but just give me free. That's the problem with our world today. People have the spirit of entitlement. I don't want to work. I don't want to trust God. I don't want God to be my source. I want the, the government to be my source. Or the church to be my source. See, everyone, it's, it's amazing. Oh, come on. I didn't do it in the first service. Should I go? Okay, I will go. Thank you. It's amazing how many people never come to church until they have a need. People at church are blessed. So people come and they say, uh, you know, uh, I have this need. Can you meet this need? Well, what have you done about it? Do you have a job? Well, no, I don't want to work. Have you ever given to anybody else? Well, no, it's, I just, I need stuff. Then my answer to you is no. No. Because you're looking to people as the source instead of God. Now, there are people who come up who are really serious and they say, you know, I got myself in a bind. And uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be kicked out of my house. Can you, can you guys help us? And we said, so we ask a little bit about, well, show me your budget. Show me what you do. Show, show me your, your, your history. Have you, have you been a giver in your life? Yeah, I have. Well, then you know what? We're going to help you. Because you don't have a spirit of entitlement. 
But the other thing, the second, the second thing is simply this. It's um, the second wrong response is being apologetic, being apologetic, being uncomfortable or feeling guilty about how that you're blessed. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but some of you that are sitting here today that God has blessed you with relationships. Um, some of you that God has blessed you with a great family. He's blessed you with finances. He's blessed you with health. And somebody who has less will come around you. And they say these little things that makes you feel uncomfortable with the blessings that you have. Anybody ever been there? And you almost feel like you need to apologize and feel guilty. Well, I'm blessed and, and they're not. Look at this. This is, uh, this is Genesis 32 verses 9 and 10. Then Jacob prayed, O Lord, who said to me, I will make you prosper. Lord, you said you're going to make me prosper, and I know you have. Look at this. I'm unworthy of all the kindness and the faithfulness you have shown your servant. Here's what he's simply saying. I don't deserve this. Now, there's a fine line to simply understand. If God is my source, I don't deserve what he's given me, that, that I'm honored that God would bless me. But then there's that other thing. When God blesses us, then the enemy tries to distort that blessing, and he simply tries to make you feel guilty for the blessings of God. And you want to apologize. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. It. And it works out like this sometimes. So you walk into a room and, and someone says, oh, I really like your shirt. And so if you've got a spirit of pride, you say, yeah, it's a Versace. You can only get this in New York. Do you, have, do, you have, do you realize how much these Versace shirts cost? Yeah. Or if it's the spirit of being apologetic. Oh, this old shirt. Oh, I bought it on sale at the Salvation Army. It was discounted way down below. Or a car. We have a car. Man, I love your car. Yeah, this is a limited edition. Only a few people drive a car like this, you know. I, I've really got it made, man. I let you sit in it. You can smell the leather. I would never let you drive it, you know, because this is my, this is my pride. Look what I've done for myself. Apologetic. But this old car, oh, it's got like 100,000 miles. And, you know, I bought it used. I bought it on the discount. Oh, yeah. That house, man, I love, I love your house. Yeah, my house. You know, we built this house. We made it. We made this. We granite countertops. I pull in the driveway. Everything is remote. The door opens for me. Somebody greets me at the door. You know, it remote controls my dog, runs the cat away. It does all those things, man. It's just, it's just, it's something I've made and I've made it happen. But on the other end, the apologetic, oh, it's just a house. It was in foreclosure. Nobody wanted it. And so we just took it. Isn't it amazing? That in the area of finances and material wealth is the only area where we feel like we have to apologize for God's blessings. You don't apologize anywhere else. Somebody comes up to me and says, man, you've really got a fine wife. She's nice. And I'll say, you're right. I would never say, I got her half price. I love your kids. They're really great kids. Oh, if you knew my kids, they're demon possessed. <laughs> I've struggled with this area of apologetics, apologizing for God's blessings all my life. Especially being in ministry. If God blesses you, then people are always, well, yeah, you take church money, don't you? No, I can't even write a check around here. I don't have that power, that ability. Oh, you drive a nice car because the church pays for your car. Nope, I pay for my car just like you pay for your car. Oh, you get a housing allowance. You get a car allowance. Nope, I don't get a car allowance. Oh, they pay for your miles. No, they don't pay for my miles. I pay for my miles, sucker. I just, I'm just like you. But in ministry, because I've been doing this for 50 years, when God blesses you, then you begin to be apologetic because of the blessings that you have. But isn't it amazing? People want to be part of a church where the ministry team is blessed. And then they all often become critical because of the blessing. But nobody wants to be part of a church 
where the ministry team is broker than the Ten Commandments. I went to get a car a few years ago, a newer car. We lease most of our cars. I have a friend up in, here I'm apologetic. I have a friend up in Nashville, up in Atlanta, that takes care of me. He does all that for me. So uh, he's from a preacher's family, and he said, well, I know you want to get a new lease, but he said, here's a black one just like you have, except it's two near, three years, four years new, or whatever it was. I don't remember. He said, that way nobody will know you got a new car. Why should I apologize? Why should I apologize that it's not just what I've done with my finances. I've been a tither and a giver since I was 12. But it's not just me. My parents and my grandparents left a legacy of what it means to have a generous eye and a generous heart. I wonder how many of you that are parents are leaving a legacy and teaching your kids what it is to have a generous heart. You see, my kids are going to be more blessed than I've ever been blessed. And my grandkids, I already see it. Man, they're so smart. I, I don't know where they get it from. I think it must come straight from God. I mean, they just, they just, it just bypasses their parents and goes straight to them. And, and I think it's, I think they're blessed because of the legacy. But I still struggle with that. But I'm getting better. Several years ago, I was in a, a foreign country. I was in a small island, and their average income was three dollars a month. I stayed in a little hut that was a dirt floor and some sort of straw bed. I'm not quite sure. They would bring me my food in on a plate and I would flick the, the bugs and the roaches off of them as I would eat. On the last day of my being there after ministering for a few days, they said, would you like to go to the home where the lady cooked all your food so you can say thank you? Yeah, sure, that sounds good. So I went and again, about the kind of house that I had, dirt floor. But here she had cats and chickens up on the stove and up on the countertop and, uh, you know, and, and all of that. And then I'm thinking, now I know why I had all those bugs and everything else and those hairs in there. There's probably cat hairs, all right? So I understand that. On the final night that I was there, the missionary who was from that island said, the people have gotten together and they want to give you an offering. I said, no, I am not taking an offering from these people. I'm so blessed. Why would, I, why would I take an offering? Why would I receive it? No, I won't. I won't take it. And, and with tears in his eyes, he said, you don't understand. The people want to bless you because they know they've been blessed by you. And if you don't receive this, you will embarrass them. And you will make them feel bad for what they're doing. So reluctantly, I received it. I don't remember. It wasn't much. But to them, it was a lot. And as I was driving to the airport, here's what the Lord said to me. Let me, let me read it to you. Terry, I want to teach you to receive from me. So you'll always remember, I am your source. I believe it must crush God when we have an attitude of pride. But I believe it also must crush his heart when we have an attitude of feeling guilty because of the blessings we have, the house we live in, the car we drive. The kingdom of God is not everybody equal as far as the blessings that we live in. But we're faithful where we are. And God will bless us with the level that we need to finish and fulfill our destiny. Here's, here's, an, here's, here's the next thing I want to remember. And I'd like you to turn to with me. 2 Corinthians 9 and 11. 2 Corinthians 9 and 11. 2 Corinthians 9 and 11. This is to remember why God blessed you. Remember why God blessed you. You will be made rich in what? Notice he doesn't say just made rich with money. You're going to be made rich in every way. Relationships. Health, family, and finances is part of that. You will be made rich in every way so that you can do what? Read it with me. Be generous on every occasion. In other words, it's not just for you, but he's blessed you so that you can bless other people. And through us, 
your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. He said, when, you, when you've been blessed and you bless other people, they'll say things like this to you. Man, I was wondering how I was going to make it. In between services, in the last service was a couple of, one of our young businessmen came up to me and he said, you know, this week we understood that somebody's getting ready to be foreclosed and they just had a heart attack and going through tough stuff. And he said, you know, today you really spoke to me in that, in that teaching that one of the reasons God blessed me was to help them in this crisis. It wasn't an ongoing help, but it was in this crisis where they were right now. And, and here's what's going to happen. When they help those people, you know what those people are going to say? Oh, thank God. Thank God. I didn't know how we were going to make it. You see, when, when God uses you like that, then, then it brings thanksgiving back to God. Here, here's another verse, Genesis 12, 2 and 3. This is uh, God speaking to Abram before he became Abraham in the Old Testament. And he said, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples will be blessed through you. So Abraham is the father of our faith, right? So he's our example. So God says, if I'm a person of covenant relationship with God, he says, expect that I want to bless you. But when I bless you, I don't want to just bless you for you. I want you to be able to be a blessing for someone else. Let's say it. Blessed to be a blessing. Let's say it again. Blessed to be a blessing. Teach that to your kids. Blessed to be a blessing. So when we, when we boil it all down in one sentence, here it is. There it's in your notes. It's in the fill in. Because God has blessed us with more, we will what? Intentionally give more. Because God has blessed us with more, we will intentionally give more. But most of us, instead of being intentional givers when we get more, we become intentional consumers. Well, we paid the tithe and we've given this. And man, we've got a little extra now. What are we going to do with it? Oh, I think we'll upgrade. I think we'll do this. I think we'll do something else. Instead of saying, God, God, I've returned the tithe to you. I've been faithful with what you've asked me. And now we have a little more. We have a little extra. We got a few bills paid off. Now, what are we going to do this? What do you want to do, God, with the blessings that you've given us? He may say, well, go buy yourself, you know, a new shirt. He doesn't expect all the time that you give everything away. But the, the thing is, he expects us when we realize that he is our source. What, what do you want me to do with this, God? What do you want me to do with this? So we become more intentional in our giving. How do we do that? I think there are three levels of givers there in your notes. I think, first of all, there's what we call the spontaneous giver. Say spontaneous. Sponta I think that's where most of us are today. We're spontaneous giver. When a need arises and somebody makes us aware of that, then we spontaneously want to give. The best example of that probably is the, uh, the Good Samaritan. Uh, he sees somebody in need and everybody else passes him by. He picks him up. He takes him to the hotel. And what does he say to the keeper there? Uh, here's some money. And if it's more than that, I'll take care of that. A spontaneous giver. I don't think he woke up that morning and said, okay, Today, there's going to be a half dead man on the road. And so I need to put some extra money in my pocket so that I can be able to take care of him. No, it was a spot. A need came up and he was able to do that. It's like the need came up. We said we need to upgrade the equipment. We need to do that. And most of you gave a, a great Great, great, spontaneous giving offering to help us to do that. In February, we're going to upgrade all that equipment. So thank God because of you. Uh, the gifts for the kids next door at school. A need was aware and you met that. We're going to talk about camp coming up. We've got kids. Our camp, listen to me, parents. If you've got kids, you need to send them to summer camp. This year, it's not just uh, fun and games. This year, it's missions and it's evangelism. Costs a little more, but it's going to be worth more to their life. So you get the registration in and you worry about the rest of the money that comes in. We'll help that in uh, a lot of stuff that we do with fundraising. OK, but you do that. But now what will happen is in a few weeks, we'll say to people, hey, we need uh, some scholarships to help some of these kids because their parents don't come to church. So some of us that are spontaneous givers will say, oh, yeah, I can help meet that need, you know, um, the next level is what I call a strategic giver, a strategic giver. A strategic giver is someone who plans to be generous. Isaiah 32 and 8 says, but generous people plan to do what is generous. 
In other words, you, you make a plan to be generous. What are we going to do? M Michael last week in his video talked about that. We return the tithe back to God. And over and above that, we said, what ministries do we want to help support? What do we, how do we want to do that? So in other words, I would encourage those of you that are couples to sit down and say, okay, let's, let's work out a strategy of our giving. Right now, we're giving this as a tithe. But now, how much could we give in offering? Um, to, to different things here or to other ministries, maybe to help the homeless, uh, maybe with missions activities. Say, so, well, maybe, okay, we return the tithe back to God, and then let's give an offering of 1%, 2%, 3%. And then you sit down every month and you say, okay, God, show us this month. Show us where you want us to put the, that money. In other words, you're a strategic giver. Uh, when, they, when the wise men showed up, uh, showed up for Jesus, the Messiah was born when the wise men showed up. Uh, they looked at the Messiah, saw the Messiah, and they didn't say, Oh, gee whiz, it's the Messiah. He guys got a couple extra bucks on you so we can be sure that we give an offering here to help. You know, they're in swaddling clothes and, and you know, help him out. No, they were strategic givers. They knew they were on the way to see the Messiah, the King of Kings, and they were strategic. There's nothing wrong with being spontaneous, but we don't want to stay at spontaneous. We want to be able to get to the place that we're strategic givers. If we're, if we're blessed to be a blessing, we want to be strategic givers. We're like that here at the church. When we, when we sit down with our board of directors uh, twice a year, we say, how can we be more strategic in our giving? Who can, we, who can we support? How can we support them? How can we do that? We want to be givers. We want to give things away. We want to do the best that we can do. But then there's another level. And these are the fanatics. I call them, these people, the fanatics. They're the sacrificial givers. They're the sacrificial givers. They give sometimes all. And they give sometimes till it hurts. Here, here's, a, here, here's the story. Picture, picture this now. They're in the temple. And just like today, okay, at the end of the offering, here's, what we, here's how we would do this. We put the buckets down here. And you'd come by and bring your tithe or offering, and I'd watch what you get, give in. And I know your social economic status. And so I'd say to the guys standing around me, yeah, they tipped God. They gave God a little. Oh, look at what they gave. So that's what Jesus is doing here. Now, I'm not going to do that, so just relax, okay? Here's what Jesus, Jesus sat near the collection box. And when they dropped money in, you could tell how much they gave by the sound. If you gave a lot, when those metal coins hit in, it was like, bum, 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 bum. And you say, oh yeah, prideful giver. This little lady came in, just had a few coins, and it was sort of like, ding a ding. That was it. Many rich people put in large amounts, then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. Sacrificial givers. Have you ever done that? I don't think you've ever lived until you've given sacrificially. And... Uh, you don't just jump into that. Sometimes you walk into that. When we built this building here, this first building, we had about 100 people that came to church over on the boulevard where we were. And we knew that we needed to build something bigger. We have two services now. The way we're growing, probably pretty soon we'll have three services. And who knows? I don't know. The way the Kid City Learning Center is growing next door, they may eventually take over this building and evict us. And if they do that, then we're going to have to build another auditorium. I don't know what we're going to do, but what we have, you know, maybe have four or five services. I, I don't know. I can handle it. Next week, I'm going to be preaching in Nashville. I'm preaching six times on a weekend. So I can, I can handle that at church of multiple locations, all right? I was in Phoenix a couple of weeks ago. I preached four Sundays on four services on a Sunday. I can do that. I'm in good health, strong like bull. So I can, I can do that if that's what God requires. But when we moved into this building, we all made sacrificial gifts for you to be here. Anita and I liquidated savings and retirement accounts, what little we had left after starting the church. Uh, we sold things. Some people brought in their wedding rings and said, we want to give that. I said, I'm not taking your wedding rings. 
He said, oh no, we don't have any extra right now, but we really believe in the vision of building the next building. And so they gave us their wedding rings. I gave my coins. I had a coin collection I started collecting when I was eight. My grandmothers, who had a lot of antique coins, gave me those. They were, I cherished those. I, I love those. And I simply said, what can I, what can I give that would be a real sacrifice for me? Well, I'd give my wife. No, I couldn't do that. I'd, get, I'd die. No. So I said, I'll, I'll give my coin collection. We'll sell that. So everybody gave a sacrificial gift to give us here. And we enjoy that today because of sacrificial giving. Let's bow our heads. If you're here today and you say, you know, Terry, I, I think probably I'm a, I'm a spontaneous giver. I kind of give when there's a need that's there. Nobody's going to look around at you. Nobody's going to judge you. But if that's you, I'd just like for you to raise your hand. Just be honest where you are. I'm a spontaneous giver. Thank you for hands. Thank you. 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 How many of you would say, well, I'm really not. I don't think I'm a spontaneous giver. I, I give spontaneously. But, but I really think I'm a, a, I, I have a strategy in being generous. I'm a strategic giver. Would you raise your hand? Yeah. We, we plan it out. We don't just go by the seat of our pants or by our emotions, but we plan it out. How many of you would say, at least once in my life, I know what it was like to give sacrificially? Wow. I've never seen so many hands go up so quick and so tall. Lord, I come to you today and I thank you for everyone that's here today. I thank you for those who started the tithe challenge last week, the 90-day tithe challenge. And tomorrow, Lord, I'll send out that email to encourage them because today is the first, uh, the first Sunday since they took that. They'll be, uh, have an opportunity to, to step into that. But Lord, I also pray for those today that have just been spontaneous givers. As we realize today, we've been blessed to be a blessing. Let us move beyond spontaneous giving. We continue to be spontaneous when a need arises. We see somebody struggling to pay a bill. We pay that. Uh, as we're talking about 25 days of generosity, when we see somebody in need, we're, we're generous. And then we just, uh, we just, we just live in that, in that, in that generosity. But Lord, would you take us to the level of being strategic givers? Planning out. Not just spending it all on ourselves, but okay, we got a little extra. We're blessed. God, what do you want to do with it? And then Lord, would you help us all at least once in our life to experience what it's like to give sacrificially? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Man, I, I sense that today. I sense that. Well, listen, we're getting ready to receive our tithe and our offering. Man, we rejoice today with those of you who uh, surrendered your heart to the Lord 12 or 13 uh, uh, before we ever got to that place. And please stop by. I'll be out in the foyer. Please stop by and say, hey, I prayed that prayer with you. And uh, the connection card that you have, if you're a first time guest, please bring it with you. Come out there. I have a gift that I want to give you. Ushers, we want to come on down and uh, we're going to receive our tithe and our offering. Remember, we drop in our change. Our change goes to uh, help people. We call it benevolence, but it just simply means to help people. So I'm going to give you a chance to get ready for that. But before we do, let's pray the prayer that we pray um, as we present our tithe and offering. Let's, let's pray it. Will you pray it with me right now? Lord, Receive our tithe and offerings as an expression of our love and obedience to you. Let's, let's pause there. Lord, some of us are already given online today and others are giving today for the first time and others are giving. Uh, they just, they just, they're just strategic givers. But Lord, we, we return the tithe and give offerings today as an expression of our love and obedience to you. We thank you, Lord, for all you have given us. You are the provider of all things. According to your word in Malachi 3, we ask that you rebuke the devourer, open the windows of heaven, pouring out your overflowing blessings, expanding our borders with jobs, raises, commissions, bonuses, and benefits. We are believing you for sales, settlements, unexpected income, interest, wise investments, and debts being paid. 
As we honor your word, give us favor with man, give us wisdom and creativity to craft an event what will other benefit others and bring wealth into the kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of our financial needs. Help us to be good stewards of all you have given us that we might give into your kingdom and to promote the truth of the gospel throughout the earth. Amen. Ushers are going to pass the buckets, drop in your connection card, drop in your tithe and your offering. Please don't leave just yet. But let me just remind you of a couple things. We have the meeting coming up in the villages, so be sure you let us know about that. Uh, uh, marriage retreat in September. Uh, we're going to go to Gatlinburg. And uh, those of you who have signed up, Chris uh, wants to meet with you. Uh, at the end of the service in the foyer, Chris is in the back there. He's the handsome guy that has a really great wife. Okay, so back there. And we have about six spots left. If you'd like to go with us to Gatlinburg, uh, it's going to be a great event. That's in September. Also, remember, growth track in February we will not be having because we're upgrading everything. And we'll start fresh in March. And uh, those of you that have kids in Kid City, would you do me a favor? Just as soon as we could, as soon as I release the blessing over you and we, we sing a little bit of this worship song, would you hurry on over and release the workers with your kids? And then bring them back, get a bunch of donuts, and, uh, and sign up for a life group as you go. But let's, uh, let's help our workers over there. They work so very hard. Would you stand? Let me release a blessing over you. Would you lift your hands right now? Let me release a blessing over you. Thank you for coming today. Thank you. Don't miss next week. We're going to wrap up this session. Let's just pray right now. Father, I just bless right now everyone that's here today. I bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I speak prosperity and blessings and faith and healing over you. I speak unity into your family. I speak the blessed life. I speak the blessed life into you. And as you leave this week, I pray that you will love God, that you will help people and build the kingdom of God. May God richly bless you in all that you do. Let's sing a little bit more of this song. If you need prayer, the prayer team will be down front. God bless you. Thank you for coming today. Death could not hold you.